Greetings, and welcome back to another fantastic episode of Remake or Rebreak. Last time we took a thorough look at Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage for the PlayStation, as well as its remake in the Spyro Reignited trilogy. To quickly recap the previous videos, I maintain that Spyro 1 is a bona fide classic with a clever art style, unique music, and an incomparable core game loop. However, its single-minded focus on core gameplay and little else led the game to become boring over time. Spyro 2 I thought was an overall good game that made some strides in visuals and music as well as tightening up the controls, but failed to properly eclipse its predecessor thanks to a smattering of mediocre minigames, meandering level design, unnecessary backtracking to older stages, uneven content pacing specifically in Autumn Plains, and a poorly executed story even by kiddie platforming standards. Now arguments I made in those videos will be relevant here, and for the sake of keeping the timestamp down as much as I can, I request that you watch those two videos first if you haven't already. Today, we return to finish what we started by looking at Spyro Year of the Dragon for the PlayStation, or Spyro 3 as I usually call it, as well as its remake in the Reignited trilogy. While there is a sizable crowd that considers this the best game in the series, including yours truly, generally speaking, most reviewers consider Spyro 3 the weakest of the Insomniac games. Similarly, the Reignited version has developed a reputation for being unpolished and glitchy, which we'll certainly discuss. As always, Remake or Rebreak is a review segment where I look at the classics of the past to see how well they hold up today, with a special emphasis on how well subsequent significant re-releases, which include remakes, later gen ports, remasters, reimaginings, etc., recreate and improve upon the original experience. Today, I want to address three questions. First, how well does Spyro 3 hold up in 2020 as a game on its own? Second, how well does the remake and the Reignited trilogy hold up to the standards of the previous two games. Finally, do I think Spyro 3 deserves its reputation as the weakest game in the trilogy? Without further ado, this is Spyro Year of the Dragon Remake or Rebreak. We begin, as always, with the story. Last time, I talked about the story in Spyro 2 for 20 minutes. I'm gonna try to tone things down, but at the same time, I want to substantiate why I consider this a huge improvement over the plots of the first two games. If you really don't care about the story at all, feel free to skip to this timestamp. The game opens in artisans with all the dragons and hunters sleeping around a batch of dragon eggs. Suddenly, a hooded figure and an army of Rhinox emerge from a network of tunnels and escape with all of the dragon eggs. As it turns out, the hooded figure is working for the sorceress, a mysterious powerful witch who rules over the forgotten worlds with an iron fist and an army of Rhinox soldiers. With help from Zoe, the dragon elders get a sense of what's going on and send Spy and Hunter down the tunnels to retrieve the dragon eggs. In the process, Spyro inadvertently jumpstarts a revolution against the sorceress by freeing each of the worlds from the Rhinox grasp one by one. Joining forces with local rebels Sheila the Kangaroo, Sergeant Bird, Bentley the Yeti, and Agent Nine, Spyro sets out to retrieve all 150 eggs, liberate the forgotten worlds from Rhinox occupation, and defeat the sorceress once and for all. On the surface, the plot repeats a lot of elements from Spyro 2. It's also not a terribly complicated plot, nor is it a contender for the greatest story ever told. Still, the story of Spyro 3 manages to succeed everywhere the first, and especially the second game, failed while going above and beyond for a kiddie platformer. In my previous reviews, I've argued that while story can be engaging in its own right, at the bare minimum it should contextualize gameplay in service of some kind of goal the player is motivated to accomplish. And you really don't need 40 hours of cutscenes or deep resonating themes themes to accomplish that much, and as always, I point to Banjo-Kazooie as an example of how to do this well. The gameplay is framed as a means of getting even with Gruntilda, a compelling antagonist the player loves to hate. Both of the previous Spyro games attempted to replicate the Gruntilda effect, somewhat succeeding the first time and stumbling pretty badly the second time. Spyro 3 attempts the Gruntilda effect again, and succeeds not once, but twice. Unlike her predecessors, the 
Sorceress manages decent characterization, a strong, well-substantiated motivation, and, most importantly, serves as a powerful gameplay motivator to rival or even exceed Gruntilda in the first Banjo-Kazooie game. Part of what makes the Sorceress work so well is her relationship with the game's secondary antagonist, Bianca. One of the rare Spyro characters to display any sort of strong, organic character development. Bianca is quickly established as a rival character who periodically appears to antagonize Spyro, immediately setting up the extent of the Sorceress's conquest. A lot of her master's nastier traits have rubbed off on her, making Bianca something of a wannabe sorceress. But you also get a sense that Bianca is forcing a facade of sorts, with the kind-hearted personality peeking through the cracks. Following an act of kindness by her enemies, Bianca undergoes a change of heart, and her reluctance to follow the sorceress's increasingly violent methodology creates a palpable tension in their scenes together. The glue holding Bianca and the sorceress together is an energy crisis sweeping the Forgotten Worlds, which is quickly set up in the first 10 minutes and developed throughout the rest of the game. As it turns out, the dragons used to live in the Forgotten Worlds, but the sorceress eventually banished them to what would later become the Dragon Kingdom. The sorceress discovered too late, however, that the dragons were the source of all the magic in their world. Without dragons, the portals are blinking out and certain pleasures the inhabitants once took for granted have started to disappear. Given what's at stake, the sorceress ordering a mass kidnapping of dragons takes on a tinge of grey morality, and explains why Bianca would go along with it despite clearly having reservations. The back and forth between Bianca and the sorceress is peak spiral writing and does a lot to flesh out both characters. You bumbling, idiotic, worthless fool! I ask you to carry out one simple task, and you fail me! I should have known better than to rely on a child. But don't worry about it. I'll deal with them now. Through interactions alone, you get a sense that the sorceress considers everyone else disposable and worth less than the dirt beneath her feet, as she remorselessly grills Bianca for every failure and then mutates her Rhinoch minions into hideous abominations without a second thought. Put simply, the sorceress is a gaping asshole, but to quote Alora from the second game, That's exactly the point! The sorceress is engaging precisely because she's self-absorbed and completely unsympathetic, while Bianca is engaging because we know deep down she's a good person, and we want to see her do what she knows is right and stand up to her master. On that note, Bianca's turn to the good side is built up gradually throughout the game and executed perfectly. You get a sense that Bianca only went along with the sorceress's plan because she was afraid of her master and because she convinced herself she was doing the right thing due to the dwindling magic in her world. Ultimately, in a bombshell scene, it's revealed that the sorceress never cared about her world or her subjects at all and planned to commit mass genocide of the entire dragon race so she alone could become immortal. It's even implied by the sorceress being over a thousand years old and saying that she'll die without magic, that she's been using it to keep herself alive for centuries and that's why her world's magic ran out to begin with. After learning this, Bianca reaches a breaking point and rejects the sorceress, teaming up with Spyro and Hunter to find another solution to the energy problem. In other words, character development. I love it. Moneybags also returns from Spyro 2, acting as a tertiary antagonist. While Moneybags was always kind of a prick, his money-grubbing douchebaggery reaches an all-time low in Spyro 3, where he exploits both sides of the Spyro and Sorcerer's conflict to line his own pockets. What? No? What else are you going to do with all those gems? Buy flying lessons? <laughs> That was a good one. Moneybags in Spyro 3 is such a selfish, irredeemable, unapologetic, money-grubbing bastard that you can't help but love to hate him. Head on in, Spyro. It should be a thrilling match. In fact, <laughs> I've even placed a little wager on the Rhinoc team. Let's just hope the local team doesn't have any last-minute accidents with every paywall becoming more blatant and arbitrary than the last. Consequently, there's nothing more satisfying than when Spyro finally loses his patience and reclaims every single one of Moneybag's stolen gems one by one. That, my friends, is how you execute the Gruntilda effect, and Ripto should really be taking notes. 
In addition to being genuinely entertaining, the story motivates and contextualizes gameplay far better than the previous two games. For one thing, the annoying trend of offloading critical exposition to the manual because the writers forgot to put it in the game is finally over. That said, if you're curious how dragons reproduce, given that there wasn't a single female dragon in the entirety of Spiral 1, the manual does have an answer for that. But that also wasn't a question I really found myself asking, since where the eggs came from doesn't matter nearly as much as the fact that they were stolen. Because of that, everything you need to emotionally invest yourself in Spyro 3's plot is presented in the game proper, no exceptions. Also, while previous games had to inorganically force Spyro into the role of protagonist, Year of the Dragon provides a simple, concrete reason why Spyro is the only dragon who can retrieve the eggs. Spyro, you'll have to go. Nobody else can fit down the holes. And that's all we needed. Upon arriving in Sunrise Spring, Bianca basically triple dog dares you to get 100%, which gets me anxious to prove her wrong and galvanizes me into full collectathon mode. Those eggs belong to us now, and I've hidden them in places you'll never find in a thousand years. Besides, even if you could find an egg, our expertly trained armies will dispose of you and take it back. Do I make myself clear? Unlike Spyro 2, where Ripto was never mentioned outside of the hub worlds even a single time, Spyro 3 follows Spyro 1 in frequently name-dropping the sorceress in stages. Spyro, the idols we were carving have come to life! They've locked us out of our temples and stolen our food! Eustace and I were having a snowman building competition when the sorceress brought them to life with a spell. Since then, they've been stomping around, building ice walls and generally causing trouble. Even when NPCs don't directly mention her, the army of Rhinox gives her a titanic, all-encompassing presence and makes the Forgotten Worlds feel like a cohesive world. While that does mean that the plot of most levels boil down to Rhinox showed up and did a thing, you could similarly reduce the plot of every Spyro 2 level to so-and-so bad guy showed up and did a thing. The critical difference is that in this game, the B-plot served to reinforce the core conflict and motivate the player to take out the sorceress. While in in Spyro 2, the B-plots had no concrete connection to Ripto at all and made it come off as though most of Avalar didn't even know he was there. It is true that neither the Sorceress or her army really impact the Midnight Mountain stages. However, you could have potentially already fought the Sorceress before playing those levels, so expanding to more micro-conflicts is excusable at that point. Moreover, the B-plots of those levels are generally better executed than the majority of Spyro 2 stages. On top of all that, Spyro 3 is just much better about giving you macro goal feedback. You progress from hub world to hub world by freeing the denizens of each level. In return, those denizens build you transportation to the next hub world, which is infinitely more satisfying than the talismans from the last game. Between each hub world, you witness the sorceress becoming increasingly frustrated with Spyro's advancement, ratcheting up the tension in the overarching narrative while giving you a sense that playing levels is actually accomplishing something. In terms of the character, Spyro himself is pretty much the same as ever. Like Spyro 2, he doesn't really talk that much, but when he does, it is entertaining and in line with his toned down characterization from the second game. The ending especially, I think, adds a new dimension to his character that we haven't seen before. It's a sad sight, Sparks. Another noble warrior falls victim to the plague of love. Just look away. Spyro may have saved the world three times since that fateful day in Artisans, but he's still got a lot of growing up to do. Hunter also appears consistently throughout the game in a role similar to that of Spyro 2, though he's noticeably braver and quicker to jump into action this time around. In terms of the new characters, they're certainly on par with the Avalar cast and actually play a more active role in the story besides standing around and hoping Spyro will solve all their problems. Sheila the Kangaroo is basically what Alora always should have been. Friendly and willing to stick up for her friends, but also brash, opinionated, and quick to violence. This swamp smells so sweet. The springtime trees are fragrant. I'm off to kick butt. Sergeant Bird is the charismatic leader of the Hummingbird Resistance against the Sorceress. He's loyal, strategic, and fights for what he believes in, but is also something of a romantic and has a secretive side. She's just a friend, you understand. It's a strictly platonic relationship. Bentley the Yeti is surprisingly my favorite of the new characters. While he looks like a lumbering, violent beast, Bentley is actually incredibly intelligent and sophisticated. With the humility of a wounded sparrow, I genuflect to my noble deliverer. 
Finally, we have Agent 9, who is violent, unhinged, and harbors an unhealthy obsession with Rhinox. One of those dogs with funny hats put a curse on me just because I shot him in the butt a couple of times. <laughs> he said he turned my tail into a snake. Does it look like a snake to you? It does feel kind of funny. Come to think of it, oh boy, that dog's gonna pay. While not the deepest characters ever, they're at least on par with, if not better, than the Avalar cast from the last game. Spyro 3 also has much better production value than both of the previous games. The cutscene animations are a lot smoother and more expressive than Spyro 1, and especially Spyro 2, with the sorceress having easily the best facial animations in the whole trilogy. More importantly, the sound engineering is a lot more professional than the last game. The voice acting is also pretty solid, with Pamela Hayden as Bianca being particularly standout. There are a lot of subtleties to her performance, and you can tell she really gave it her all to play a magic anthropomorphic rabbit, no less. So yeah, that's Spyro 3's story. While Spyro 2 failed to execute a story that practically writes itself, Spyro 3's story is everything it should have been, and so much more. However, it's not a perfect story. So let's start with the smaller things and work our way up to the bigger stuff. First, Spyro 3 has removed the intro and outro cutscenes from from Spyro 2. For some reason, the writers in that game thought that rando NPCs dying in over-the-top violent ways was really funny even though it makes the other NPCs come off as unlikable and uncaring about their situation. That said, I still would have preferred that Insomniac attempted to improve these intro-outro scenes rather than cutting them altogether. Second, again like Spyro 2, there's some quibbly little plot holes that gear my grinders. For example, why do these fireflies need to light the bombs before they start moving towards the cages. Zoe says that Sparks unlocks new abilities because dragon magic rubbed off on him, but Sparks literally hangs out with the dragon 24 hours a day. Sergeant Berg mentions that he couldn't use his rocket launchers to escape from the sorceress because he has limited ammo, even though Sergeant Bird could have realistically gotten more ammo after he escaped, and even then, in gameplay, you have unlimited ammo. Again, I consider these minor criticisms, certainly compared to what the story does well, but I'm trying to be thorough for the sake of the review. Third, many of the B-plots follow a trend from Spyro 2 of subverting the player's expectations in a way that undermines their sense of accomplishment. In Fireworks Factory, Greta basically beats the level for you, which essentially makes the level pointless since it makes no difference whether Spyro was there or not there. The twist that Doug here actually put up the ice blocks in Icy Peaks adds nothing and is actually less interesting than if the Rhinox had done it. The only time one of these subversions really works is in Charmed Ridge. Amy and Azrael being star-crossed lovers dogged by both the sympathetic and antagonistic characters in the stage is satisfying in a way that a statue squishing the Colossus Yeti and robbing the player of a boss fight just isn't. Fourth, much like Spyro 2, the in-level cutscenes have not returned to the production value of Spyro. One. We still get recycled character models that stand in place and repeat stock animations and lip sync. Again, this is fine for a PlayStation game, but the first game still looked better in this regard. Fifth, I should note that whenever I refer to the PlayStation version of Spyro 3 in this review, I'm talking about the NTSC Greatest Hits version of Year of the Dragon. The original Black Label version was rushed and has a lot of bugs. Notably, the cutscene Spike is Born exists on the disc and can be accessed with cheat codes, but for some reason it doesn't play where it should in the actual game. Seeing as this is a great scene that develops the central conflict, that is a glaring omission. Finally, and this is my biggest criticism, I think the writers seriously missed out on giving the Sorceress and Spyro a one-on-one -on -one conversation before the final boss. The Sorceress is such a hateful, spiteful wench who subjugated her kingdom for centuries and put the survival of Spyro's entire species in jeopardy for her own selfish gain. That should make for a great dialogue exchange dripping with character and emotion. Instead, entering the Sorceress's lair just takes you straight to the boss battle. I still think the exchanges we did get between Bianca and the Sorceress are great and complete both characters, but it's a pretty blatant omission from what is otherwise a solid script. So yes, I have my criticisms, but none of them are nearly bad enough to significantly detract from what is for all intents and purposes a great story. 
So let's talk Reignited Trilogy. How does Spyro 3 Reignited approach retelling what was already a great story by 3D platforming standards? The production value echoes Spyro 2 Reignited and recycling stock character models and animations like the PlayStation version. That said, I did notice that repeated NPC species tended to have more unique geometry, and recurring characters like Moneybags tend to have more unique animations compared to the last game. I still would have appreciated it if the game used fewer stock animations and followed the first game's example of redesigning every NPC and providing unique animations for every cutscene. When it comes to the main cutscenes, the characters are well animated with a strong attention to the 12 principles of animation and an eye for clarity and detail. The lip sync and blocking is strong in virtually every scene, with every mouth movement perfectly conveying the intended emotions. Again, like Spyro 2 Reignited, I noticed a lot of smaller touches that add to the character. I enjoy how Moneybag's gut reaction to being shot by rockets is to protect his gem bag, or Hunter's reaction to Bianca holding his hand, or Bianca's rabbit-like mannerisms to express her emotions in a given scene. While many major cutscenes are still pre-rendered in low-quality MP4s, surprisingly the scenes where you free Sheila, Sergeant Bird, Bentley, and Agent 9 actually play in engine. These cinematics look really good in native 4K, so I don't understand why every cutscene couldn't have run in-engine when pre-rendering takes up more disk space and looks worse. I mean, I'll take some in-engine cutscenes over none, but I'm just saying. Like Spyro 2 Reignited, only a few actors return for the remake, namely Tom Kenny as Spyro, the Professor, and Sergeant Bird, as well as Richard Tatum as Agent 9. That said, Robbie Damon, Cassandra Lee Morris, and J.B. Blanc return from Spyro 2 Reignited as Hunter, Alora, and Moneybags, respectively, and perform just as well as they did before. JB Blanc especially has cemented himself as my favorite Moneybags. I already thought Neil Ross was great in the original, but JB Blanc delivers Spyro 3 dialogue with an unmatched conviction that makes the build-up to Moneybags' downfall even more satisfying than ever. It just happens that I know the uh, password to open the door to the tomb of the stone golem, but it seems to have slipped my mind for the moment. If you know what I mean. <laughs> Very well then. The password to open the tomb is... Are you ready? <laughs> Gullible! Bianca was recast with Melissa Hutchison, and while I will probably always prefer Pamela Hayden in my heart of hearts, Hutchison's performance only seems to grow on me every time I replay this remake. Perhaps my favorite recast was Misty Lee as the Sorceress. She has one bad read in her introductory cutscene, but otherwise she provides an interesting new look into the character while not sounding radically different from Flo D. Ray. You bumbling! Idiotic, worthless fool! I asked you to carry out one simple task and you fail me! I should have known better than to rely on a child. But don't worry about it. I'll deal with them now. A lot of the same voice talent from Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 Reignited returned to voice the NPC cast, and while it's not a one-to-one -one copy of the original voice acting, it's pretty solid for what it is. In terms of what the remake changes, obviously the character designs were updated along with the Avalar cast. Sergeant Bird, Agent 9, and Bianca especially don't look radically different from their PlayStation designs. Though on the whole, I'd say Sergeant Bird still looks a lot better than his doofy PS1 model. Generally speaking, the remake doesn't really rock the boat too hard when it comes to rando NPCs either. Though these renaissance looking guys now carry around lattes, which makes it harder to take this guy seriously. I was playing catch with my pet wolf Farley, but I accidentally threw his ball down this hole and he went in after it. Now he's stuck down there and I feel so helpless sitting up here listening to his steadily softening whimpers. I actually really get a kick out of the toothy grins of the Rhinox here. They just look so much more hateful and mischievous than they did on PlayStation. Surprisingly, the most controversial redesign is Sheila the Kangaroo and Honestly, I'm not really sure why. I mean, her original design is just a generic kangaroo. What was so special about this? 
Compared to that, her new design is a lot more appealing, with the jacket and especially the red hair suiting her perfectly. Bentley's design was similarly updated and, as far as I'm concerned, it's all for the better. His original design was okay, but he had kind of a crooked posture and dopey looking face. This new design better signifies his gameplay style of powerhouse combat without undermining his intelligence and eloquent speech. Perhaps my favorite differences regard some subtle tweaks to the sorceress's character. While still a callous, remorseless witch willing to sacrifice the lives of an entire species for her own selfish gain, Misty Lee's portrayal is a little more feminine than Flo D. Ray's. This, along with the new lipstick and beauty mark, gives the sense that the sorceress is vain, self-absorbed, and obsesses over how she looks. Thus, when she says she wants to live forever, what she really means is that she wants to be young and beautiful forever. Given that she complains about a statue of her looking too ugly, it's not too far-fetched. This adds a bit of extra dimension to her character and rounds out her motivation somewhat while still retaining everything that was great about her in the original game. Shockingly, Year of the Dragon is the only game of the three to actually change the script, whereas the other two games just copied the original script verbatim without addressing any of the problems. Specifically, Spyro 3 Reignited actually adds some new lines. This dragon here says, Get her! <gasps> Stop! Which is a small improvement, given how oddly silent the dragons were watching invaders kidnap their children. The more interesting additions are added dialogue from Sergeant Bird, Bentley, and Agent Nine during Bianca's conversations with the sorceress. While not a change I was particularly begging for, in retrospect it was odd how these characters made cameos in these scenes but didn't really react to what was going on. Seeing these characters react to Rhinox transforming into giant monsters was interesting and a worthwhile while addition for as small as it is. The one change we didn't get, however, was my coveted one-on-one -on -one convo between Spyro and the Sorceress. I understand that an entire additional cutscene is a little more work-intensive than some stray lines, especially given how rushed this trilogy was, <sighs> but as long as we're gonna add things that weren't in the original script, then why not? With all that covered, let's talk about graphics. I'm not really sure what I can say about Spyro 3 that I haven't already said about the first two games. As usual, I'm running Spyro 3 on authentic PlayStation hardware over RGB SCART, playing on my PVM monitor, and digitizing with the open source scan converter. Like the previous games, Spyro 3 runs at 512 pixels wide, and like Spyro 2, it opts for a performance saving 216 pixels tall to match Naughty Dog's crash games. The level of detail technique returns from the previous games to increase the draw distance and allow for larger environments without settling for fog or dips in the performance. On that note, Year of the Dragon does run at a consistent and evenly paced 30 FPS 95% of the time, but like the previous two games, the game has its fair share of screen tearing. Again, it's not super frequent, but it is distracting when it happens. In terms of the art itself, this is the third game in the series, and by this point Insomniac had perfected an art style that transcends the limited polygons and resolution to create something appealing, charming, and oddly timeless. Similar to Avalar, the Forgotten Worlds encompass a diversity of landscapes that defy common level archetypes. We have shipwrecked badlands, cloud factories, Roman villas, Asiatic temples, floating crystal islands, frozen Aztec pyramids, enchanted castles, and dinosaurian homesteads. While the levels in this game are genuinely creative and visually interesting, I do feel like the levels in Spyro 2 were a little more creative on the whole, there are a few stages like Icy Peak, Spooky Swamp, and Seashell Shore that just kind of play the level archetype straight. Still, having unique themes for 13 out of 16 main stages isn't bad, especially three games in. Other than that, I'm inclined to say Spyro 3 is the best looking game of the original trilogy. Not by a super wide margin or anything, but generally speaking I find the models look that slightest bit better, and the textures are marginally more detailed than better drawn. Beyond these trees textured on the walls and spooky swamp, I can't really think of any down points to the graphics in Spyro 3. I mean, I guess the color palette in Bamboo Terrace is a little washed out, but I'll take that over the homely palette from Mystic Marsh any day. Otherwise, I think this game looks great and sends off the PS1 with a visual bang. Which brings us to Spyro 3 Reignited. Like the previous reviews, we're gonna focus primarily on the PC version for the highest resolution and frame 
frame rate. So far, I've praised the graphics in the Reignited trilogy, and Spyro 3 Reignited continues the same high quality standard. Once again, we have a gorgeous, charming, and cartoony visual aesthetic that a more realistic art style could never hope to match. The colors are stark and striking, and the environments have greatly increased in detail over the PlayStation original. We also have pretty lighting and specular maps, gorgeous particle effects, and some very nice looking models for 2018. The previous games looked absolutely fantastic in native 4K, and Spiral 3 Reignited is no exception. One thing I forgot to mention in the last two reviews is the new UI art, which is a significant improvement over the original games. While it got the job done, the monochromatic 3D lettering in Spiral 1 looks kind of tacky, and the pre-rendered book textures from the sequels look straight out of an early PC CD-ROM game. The Reignited trilogy redesigns the menus with a consistent art style while assigning a distinct color to each game, with Spyro 1 being purple, Spyro 2 being blue, and Spyro 3 being orange. This helps the Reignited trilogy feel more cohesive as a package while still allowing each game to stand apart visually. In my Spyro 1 review, I said that I considered the Spyro Reignited trilogy the best looking game I had ever played when considering resolution, frame rate, visual style, and level of detail. While I was certainly referring to all three games as a package, I was thinking of Spyro 3 Reignited specifically when I said that, because this is my favorite looking game I've ever played full stop. Spyro 2 Reignited was already more visually engaging than Spyro 1 Reignited, so my preference for Spyro 3 Reignited's visuals comes down to the slightly better use of color and the overall higher level of detail and the environment geometry. Again, I loved the graphics in the original, but stages like Midnight Mountain, Seashell Shore, Evening Lake, Lost Fleet, Sunrise Spring, Bamboo Terrace, and Spooky Swamp see a massive visual overhaul here that goes beyond simple hardware differences. Meanwhile, levels I already liked looking at in the original, like Cloud Spires, Fireworks Factory, Country Speedway, Frozen Altars, Enchanted Towers, Icy Peak, and Sunny Vila look better than ever. Charmed Ridge especially is the best looking level in the entire package. It's just a gorgeous stage from top to bottom. That said, the performance stutters from Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 Reignited on PC carry over to this game as well. While the 60 FPS is consistent 98% of the time and makes makes all the difference in the world for moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, Spyro 3 Reignited still isn't above the occasional frame drop. Again, I'm playing this in native 4K with maxed out settings, but I feel like a port of a console game should run a little smoother than this. Speaking of console ports, we still have to look at Spyro 3 Reignited on console. In my previous reviews, I looked at the PS4 Pro and Xbox One X ports and found that while the 1440p looked nice, and while the 30fps appeared more or less consistent consistent in footage, during gameplay the game suffers from noticeable micro stutter that has been documented by sites like Digital Foundry. All we have left to talk about is the Switch version, which is unsurprisingly the weakest version in terms of resolution, frame rate, and performance. Now I understand that some people only care about graphics so much and just want a straightforward, affordable platform to play the latest releases, and in that regard the Switch absolutely fills that niche. Even then, I can still point to a lot of great first-party games on the Switch that will be renowned for both their game design and clever art direction for the rest of time. For those reasons, some might say that criticizing the Switch version of the Reignited trilogy for its graphics is redundant. I mean, of course an Unreal Engine 4 game targeting the PS4 isn't gonna run as well on Switch. What did you expect, right? Still, this is a comparison video, and we have to talk about what makes the Switch version different from the others, so I have to pick on the graphics at least a little bit. Now, I think it's fair to say that unless you play in handheld mode a lot, the Switch version of a cross-platform game is generally the worst on the technical side if nothing else. Even then, most first-party games run in non-native resolutions in handheld mode, and I find that pretty distracting. Unfortunately, the Spyro Reignited trilogy is actually worse than the standard in this regard. As reluctant as I am to accept it, the standard for performance on the Nintendo Switch is 900 100p 30fps. Maybe 864p 30fps if the game is really pretty. Every once in a while we get a Wii U port running at 1080p 60fps, which is great when we do get it, but I understand that for an Unreal Engine 4 game that's asking a lot. Even by these standards, the Reignited trilogy still falls flat, targeting a dynamic resolution with a max of 720p and a minimum of 
1440p. Now, with Mario Odyssey, I could accept dynamic resolution as a trade-off for a consistent 60fps on console, and even the Xenoblade games have the excuse of being enormous. The Reignited Trilogy doesn't have either of those excuses, seeing as it's fairly small and barely reaches 30fps. Even then, the models and materials have seen a noticeable downgrade as well. The environments are basically swapped out for the lower level of detail versions, e.g. the lower poly geometry you would normally only see at a distance, and the textures look straight out of an N64 game sometimes. In a professional product, I really shouldn't be able to make out every individual pixel on Moneybag's face texture. Usually, when a game runs in standard HD, I can at least set the console to 720p and upscale it cleanly to 4K, but much like Breath of the Wild on Wii U, in this game the UI runs at 1080p even though the in-game graphics run at 720p or lower, meaning that no matter which resolution you pick, you still get a bunch of blurry non-integer filtering on the 3D elements. Now, I'm sure I'm the only one who notices or cares about this kind of thing, but when you spend as much time and money scaling and editing video as I have, you notice it and it drives you nuts. Oh, and I also noticed that the audio quality of the voice acting is much lower than the other versions as well. You shouldn't anger a magician, Spyro. I just might decide to turn you into a blue hedgehog or something. You shouldn't anger a magician, Spyro. I just might decide to turn you into a blue hedgehog or something. Now, I'd show off some better footage of the game running in portable mode, but unfortunately I don't own an internal Switch capture card and the company that manufactured them went out of business. Because of that, the best I could do was use the Switch's built-in recording software, which has an abysmal bitrate relative to the rest resolution, but is at least better than me sticking a camera in front of the screen. It's worth noting that the game looks somewhat better in real time than the footage suggests due to the heavy-handed MP4 compression. Even still, this game looks noticeably worse in handheld mode than it does docked. The game still runs at a dynamic resolution ranging from 648p to 432p, with even blurrier textures and chunkier geometry. Also, as much as I really don't want to feed into the meme, I wouldn't be doing my due diligence as a reviewer if I didn't mention the checkerboarded elephant in the room. Yeah, this game has a lot of dithering. And yes, the dithering and blurry textures are 100% obvious even on the actual screen. Apparently, this is just a staple of the Unreal Engine, and it seems that the other versions of the Reignited Trilogy just do a much better job of hiding it in handheld mode on the Switch, on the other hand, it's really, really obvious. It's worth noting that the original PS1 games have a lot of dithering too, but that was also the standard for 90s games. This game came out in 2019, and I expected a little better. Now, truth be told, I'd actually be fine with all of that if the game at least ran well, but unfortunately, that's not the case. The Spiral Reignited Trilogy in handheld mode unfortunately drops frames and stutters all over the place. Now, I get it, it's the trade off for portability, but is a consistent 30 frames per second really that much to ask for? At what point do we draw the line and recognize bad optimization for what it is? Despite all of these problems, this game at least plays well in portable mode for the most part, and in that sense it delivers the bare minimum. The classic Spyro Trilogy on the go. Given how many times I've replayed the PS1 games on the PSP, I was hoping for a decent replacement, but unfortunately there's still something of a trade-off between the two versions. The PSP version runs far smoother in my experience, and honestly as far as portable games go, I think it maybe looks a little better, but the analog slide pad isn't properly supported. At best, you can use it to emulate the D-pad, but that's not nearly as good as full analog movement. That, and for some reason, the version of Spyro 3 on the PSN is the inferior Black Label release and not the definitive Greatest Hits version. On the other hand, the Switch version looks worse and chugs a lot, but features analog movement and camera rotation, as well as all of the fixes of the 
NTSC Greatest Hits version. I guess I prefer the Switch version, if only because I'm more likely to take my Switch on the go than my PSP. For all of its flaws, I can still think of much worse ways to spend a plane ride than the Spyro Reignited trilogy in portable mode. Beyond the portability, the Switch version also has much better rumble than the other three versions. I personally find rumble really distracting, and even if I didn't, I find that most games don't even use it that consistently. Case in point, the Xbox, PlayStation, and PC versions of the Reignited trilogy supposedly support rumble, but even when I turned the feature on, it didn't seem to do anything 90% of the time. While the rumble in this game isn't as consistent or well implemented as Super Mario Odyssey, jumping, gliding, head bashing, and the like do provide vibration feedback here that they didn't on other platforms. So, if you do like Rumble, the Switch is the only version that really supports it to any significant degree. And, as far as I can tell, there are no other major differences. Despite the Switch supporting motion controls, you can't use it to control Spyro during speedways or even aim as Agent 9 with either the Joy-Cons or the Pro Controller. Given that this is the only platform of the four to support motion controls, except if you owned a VR headset on PC, I guess, I think that's a missed opportunity. Now, with all that said, and I'm going to surprise myself by saying this, I didn't find the micro stutter as noticeable here as I did on PS4 Pro and Xbox One X. Again, I only have my own eyeballs to work with and don't have the fancy frame analysis tech of Digital Foundry to verify the frame timings down to the millisecond. Still, by my eyeballs, it felt like the Switch version was delivering frames closer to the ideal 33 millisecond timing. Or maybe it's just that the video was so blurry that the stuttering is harder to notice? I don't know. Unfortunately, this version also dropped frames or suffered other performance drops far more often, and I wrote down at least eight of these major drops in my notes. So, you can have better graphics and fewer frame drops, but have micro stutter the whole time on Xbox and PlayStation, or you can have better frame pacing on Switch, but have weaker graphics and more consistent performance drops. So, take your pick. Still, the portability factor kind of makes the Switch version worth it, at least for me. And it's still a testament to the strength of the underlying art direction that the Reignited trilogy can still be somewhat visually appealing on Switch, even when the models and textures have been reduced down to their lowest quality versions. So, yeah, if you don't have a decent PC and just want to check out the Spyro remake on console, I actually think that the Switch version is worth considering. That said, the PC version not only supports a higher graphic ceiling than all three console versions, but is also the only version to support a consistent 60fps out of the box. Once again, even if you have to lower the resolution to 720p to get it running well on your PC, the game will still play better there than on all three consoles. Moving on, let's take a moment or two to talk about the soundtrack in Spyro 3. I found that Spyro 1 had a unique style and fantasy ambiance, but with the exception of a few heavy hitters, I found a lot of the compositions pretty forgettable. Spyro 2 I thought was a substantial improvement, with overall stronger composition and a much broader soundscape. Stuart Copeland returns to compose for Spyro 3 along with co-composer Ryan Beveridge, and together they refine the Spyro soundscape to perfection while delivering the best compositions in the trilogy. Year of the Dragon and expands to include more string instruments, metal clanging, brass sections, banging percussion, record scratches, and tons of other quirky, unconventional samples I couldn't begin to describe. I find that the percussion especially is a lot stronger than in the previous games, which gives the pieces a tighter, more energetic rhythm that piggybacks wonderfully off the fast-paced core game loop. Despite sounding more conventional than Spyro 2 in many ways, tracks like Harbor Speedway, Spooky Swamp, Sheila's Alp, Molten Crater, Enchanted Skate Park, and Agent 9's lab managed to subvert musical conventions while being easier to listen to than something like Breeze Harbor. While the hub music in Spyro 2 had a relaxing atmosphere but no real melody, the Spyro 3 hub themes rectify this with some similarly relaxing harmonics while offering some genuinely catchy, memorable melodies. Evening 
like especially is everything that the Spyro 2 hub themes always should have been. Are there any flaws with the soundtrack? Well, if I have to dig into the nitty gritty, I do find that some of the later boss themes are just kind of okay, but even then, Buzz's Dungeon is easily my favorite boss theme in the entire series, so that kind of balances it out. Also, much like how Spyro 2 recycled the Idle Springs theme for Fracture Hills, Spyro 3 similarly uses a slight remix of Sheila's theme for Lost Fleet and recycles Sergeant Bird's theme wholesale for Enchanted Towers. The Dino Mines theme is also a slight rearranging of Sunny Vila. I should note that when I say Spyro 3 has my favorite soundtrack in the trilogy, I am specifically referring to the NTSC Greatest Hits version, which is the complete soundtrack as intended. The original release, meanwhile, fails to play every track in its intended stage. In some cases, the tracks just weren't finished in time for the Fall 2000 release, and in others, glitches caused the wrong track to play. In the absolute worst case, the Sorceress boss theme is actually replaced with the first Hub World theme, which is really jarring. <laughs> While all of these issues were corrected in the Greatest Hits release, the Platinum version of Spyro 3 in the PAL region only fixes a few of these problems. Specifically, this version is still missing the themes for Evening Lake, the Sorceress's Lair, and the Enchanted Tower Skate Park, ostensibly to make room on the disc for multiple languages. Thankfully, the Sorceress boss does at least use the Spikes Arena theme and not the Sunrise Spring theme again. Even so, the soundtrack in the PAL release is nevertheless incomplete. Unsurprisingly, Steven Vankov, or is it Stefan Vankov, returns once again to remix the music for Spiral 3 Reignited. Right off the bat, I should note that the soundtrack is based on the complete track list from the NTSC Greatest Hits version in every region. Given how loyal the previous two remakes were to even the dumbest of design, I was honestly kind of worried that the remake was going to mistakenly copy the Black Label soundtrack, but thankfully that's not the case. Again, from an audio fidelity perspective, the original soundtrack sounded as good as they realistically could, so simply cranking up the sample rate or bit depth wasn't going to be enough to remaster these soundtracks. As long as the Reignited trilogy was going to include PlayStation music as an option, I really wanted Vonkov to take some risks and reinterpret the songs. Unfortunately, I found the Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 soundtracks hewed so close to the originals that Vonkov's remixes couldn't really stand on their own two feet. While Spiral 3 Reignited is hardly the big risk-taking reinvention I would have preferred, I'd still rank it Vonkov's best work for the trilogy overall. Maybe it's because I've listened to the original Spiral 3 music more often outside the game, so it's easier for me to tell the difference. Unlike Spiral 2 Reignited, where there were maybe two tracks I preferred to the originals and a couple I didn't, in Spiral 3's case I can point to many tracks that I think sound better than ever in the Reignited trilogy. I love the band Joes and Sunny Vila, the new guitars and Sheila's Alp are on point, the brass and Sergeant Bird's bass sounds a lot livelier, I prefer the buzzing synths of Country Speedway, and the marimba and Crystal Island sounds more crystally, if that makes sense. I also really appreciate how Sunrise Springs starts soft and understated before the percussion accelerates and the rhythm picks up. It gives you the feeling of starting off on a new adventure in a strange new world. Bamboo Terrace adds some backing percussion motives that feel like they always should have been there, and Frozen Altars penetrates your soul with these shivering winds and that amazing flute. Much like Sparrow 2 Reignited, Vonkov created unique mixes for levels that recycled melodies in the original, namely Enchanted Towers, Lost Fleet, and Dino Mines. In each case, I think these remixes are superior to their greatest hits counterparts and fit the stages better. While the original Sorcerer's Boss theme sounded disheveled and kind of unfinished, Vonkov's remix is significantly better with acoustic guitar, deep orchestral motives, and much stronger percussion. My favorite remix in the entire trilogy, surprisingly, is Buzz's Dungeon, which was already one of my all-time favorite boss themes. For the most part, it sounds the same, but Vonkov added a couple extra motives towards the end of the track that really complete it in a way I never knew I wanted.
That's what I meant when I said I wanted Vonkov to take more risks. I don't mean just changing the timbre slightly and calling it a day. I mean playing around with the composition to make it sound fresh and interesting, and Buzz's Dungeon and Bamboo Terrace are the only tracks where Vonkov really attempted that. I guess if I really had to nitpick, I prefer the original opening measures for Crawdad Farm, Icy Peak, and Cloud Spires, but the rest of those tracks sound just fine to me. The rest of the soundtrack I found fell into the same category as Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 Reignited. It sounds so close to the originals that I can barely tell the difference. All I can say is that I've barely listened to the remix soundtracks for the first two games outside of the game, while I've already listened to the Spyro 3 Reignited soundtrack maybe six times and prefer it to the PlayStation soundtrack on the whole. Needless to say, I give it a thumbs up. Finally, we can move on to the gameplay of Spyro 3. Starting off, the core mechanics are basically identical to that of Spyro 2. You run, jump, glide, and hover your way through 30 odd stages while flaming or charging enemies and collecting gems. Unlike Spyro 2, where you unlock new mechanics as the game progressed, in Spyro 3 you start off with the head bash, ladder climb, and swimming abilities from the get-go. Given that this was the first game in the trilogy I played, the in-game skill training was so good that I was never confused or overwhelmed with how to use all these mechanics, making their unlockable status in Spyro 2 all the more unnecessary. Spyro himself doesn't really get any mechanical expansions we haven't seen before, besides maybe the Ice Breath and Frozen Altars, but even that's just a close range version of the Ice Breath power up from Cloud Temples in the second game. The controls are one to one the same as Spyro 2, from the analog sensitivity to the button mappings, and the controls were already pretty good in that game, so I'm not complaining. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, you still use the bumpers for camera rotation, which is still too slow, and the right stick is still unused. The only real difference is that while the camera centering feature in Spyro 2 required you to press L and R together, in Spyro 3 the left and right bumpers individually center the camera while the left and right triggers turn it. While a small change, I discovered the centering feature in Spyro 3 almost immediately, while in Spyro 2 it took me several playthroughs to just kind of stumble onto it. Other than that, the core mechanics are just as satisfying as ever. Jumping, gliding, and hovering feel great, flaming and charging enemies is satisfying, and the swimming sections are still a lot of fun. On the other hand, the head bash and climbing don't really see any exciting new use cases they didn't already have in the second game. Granted, even the magma cone climbing section wasn't that great, but with the exception of a handful of ladders in desert ruins and a few in spooky swamp, climbing barely appears at all in this game. I guess head bash chests are a little more common than before, and there's one secret that uses it, but other than that, nothing. Personally, I'd rather the level and systems designers focus on mechanics that are fun rather than trying to force ones that aren't for their own sake, and for the most part Spyro 3 does just that. Similarly, I don't really have anything new to say about the Reignited trilogy as far as the core mechanics and controls go. As I said in my previous reviews, I find that the controls are tighter and overall more responsive than the original trilogy. This, along with superior sound design and animations, gives Spyro Spyro's movements much stronger feedback compared to the original Spyro 3. The full analog camera control is a blessing for certain platforming sections, but once again, I really don't understand why the game couldn't have had a sensitivity slider in the options menu. That said, I did discover during my Switch run that not only can you center the camera by tapping the left trigger, but you can also hold it down to transition into a tank control scheme similar to Banjo-Kazooie and Super Mario Sunshine. In terms of camera responsiveness, it really doesn't get any faster than that. I also discovered that you can make sharper and faster turns in the swimming and flying sections by turning the camera along with the left stick, making for smoother experiences than the original games. Other than that, the controls follow the example of Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 Reignited. In my Spyro 1 review, I praised the combat for its simple but effective enemy design that kept you on your toes while properly rewarding players for defeating all the enemies. Spyro 2 featured considerably easier enemies while also swapping out gem drops with spirit particles, which at best provide unsatisfying feedback for defeating enemies and at worst force you to re-kill a bunch of enemies to reactivate the power-up gates and repeat visits to stages. Spyro 3 immediately fixes that problem by reverting back to the Spyro 1 gem drop system. You kill a Rhinoch, you get a gem. Again, I still consider spirit particles a minor criticism, but gem drops are just more satisfying and rewarding than spirit particles ever could be. When it comes to the enemy design itself, I find it somewhat 
somewhere between Spyro 1 and Spyro 2. Like Spyro 2, a lot of the enemies in the early game especially don't put up much of a fight and practically defeat themselves. However, by the time you reach Evening Lake, the challenge starts to ramp up with enemies that give you a run for your money. These ninja Rhinox will kick your butt if you're unprepared, and really ramp up the tension in the Agent 9 section especially. These cat wizards channel the druids from Spyro 1, manipulating the environment while also gigantifying the archer and soldier Rhinox. These weird metal cup guys are kind of like the electricity norks from Spyro 1, requiring you to time your attacks accordingly. The Dino Desperados and Dino Mines give you a brief window to run up to them and attack them before they'll shoot you dead, along with dynamite throwers and turret variants that remind me of the Nork Commandos. Finally, in Haunted Tomb, these Earthshaper mummies are only vulnerable to these weird explosive snowball things, meaning you have to turn their attacks against them. Again, I still think Spyro 1 had the overall strongest combat encounters of the three games, but this is still getting pretty dang close, especially compared to the largely ineffective enemies in Spyro 2. Speaking of which, while editing for my Spyro 2 review, I realized that Ripto's rage downplayed platforming compared to the first game. While Spyro 1 consistently tested your sense of timing and spatial awareness, Spyro 2 generally had fewer bottomless pits, fewer large glides, and fewer opportunities to really flex that new hover mechanic. When I think back to my time with the second game, the only stages I can really think of that have a considerable amount of platforming in them are probably Huracos and Mystic Marsh. Spyro 3, meanwhile, brings platforming closer to its Spyro 1 roots. From the beginning, stages feature tricky glides that test your skills and force you to think about how to navigate to your destination. Mastering the hover in this game is mandatory in a way that it really wasn't in Spyro 2. Last but not least, we have exploration. In my review, I praise Spyro 1 for its clever secrets that rewarded players with gems for thinking outside the box. In Spyro 2, I found that stages were seriously lacking in these kinds of engaging secrets, with almost everything being clearly visible and accessible from the beaten path, with the exception of that one long glide from the top of the Autumn Plains castle. Spyro 3, meanwhile, features tons of these aha moments to make exploration more rewarding than either of the previous two games. Moments like taking the secret whirlwind and cloud spires after reactivating the cloud generator, the secret underground area in Sergeant Bird's base, the treetops and breakable walls in Spooky Swamp, the secret egg in Dino Mines, etc. In the case of Icy Peak especially, the moment where you figure out how to break through the ice and begin swimming underneath the level is really satisfying and adds a spike of engagement to the level that wouldn't exist otherwise. On that note, the level design is a substantial improvement over the previous two games. As I've argued, level design provides players with a playground to learn, improve, and ultimately master the systems and mechanics. Spyro 1 did this really well, though I still maintain that the Artisan's levels were maybe a bit too easy even for introductory stages. Spyro 2 revved up the pacing of the main path of stages, but emphasized meaningless meandering across the same patches of level design to destroy mystery jars and lock skill points or play annoying minigames. This made stages far more annoying and repetitive to route to 100% completion compared to the first game. Spyro 3, meanwhile, combines the stronger qualities of Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 while downplaying the weaker aspects of both games, making for the overall most polished and best designed levels in the classic Spyro series. Like Spyro 2, Spyro 3 retains the overall more streamlined golden paths, making for stages that are overall more energetic and faster paced compared to Spyro 1. Stages also followed the example of Fracture Hills and Aquaria Towers and structuring every level like a giant donut. In other words, the ending of each stage loops back into the start with a shortcut permanently opening for repeat visits. While a small change, this makes routing stages significantly faster and more convenient compared to the first two games, which either didn't have shortcuts at all or featured arbitrary points of no return back to the start. Each level also features a handful of side areas accessible by mini portals and bridged by minimal loading screens. While primarily intended to house the minigames, these side areas still feature gems to collect, enemies to defeat, and even secrets to find. What's nice about relegating minigames to side areas is that it cuts down on potential within level backtracking over Spyro 2, leaving the main path of each stage fast-paced and well-optimized like Spyro 1, while better optimizing player guidance and navigation with stronger signifiers to communicate what is optional and what isn't. Best part is that you can instantly 
actually teleport yourself back to the main stage through the pause menu, so as far as I'm concerned, these side areas are an unambiguous improvement over the previous two games. Despite all the new characters, all the minigames, the new side areas, and even some within level backtracking, Spyro 3 levels are still fast-paced, straightforward, and fun as all hell to fully complete. Core-centric minigames can still be finished in a couple of minutes or less, with only a few exceptions. More importantly, I find stages more fun to route than the previous two games. It's fun to discover micro-optimizations to cut down on repeated travel and to beat the stage that much quicker, and all of this is achievable without having to exploit glitches the designers never intended, which is the sign of a better designed game. Now granted, I'm sure that if I looked at the timestamps in my footage, I'd discover that Spiral 3 stages are the overall longest of the three games, but considering I was having fun the entire time and never felt like stages were slow, boring, or poorly paced, to me it doesn't matter if they're statistically longer because they didn't feel that way. So yeah, I enjoy virtually every level in Spyro 3 from top to bottom, but no game is perfect and Spyro 3 stages certainly have their share of flaws I'd like to discuss in the interest of fairness. First off, there's something about Lost Fleet that just doesn't vibe with me. I can't even say that it's a badly designed stage necessarily, because there's some really fun platforming and exploration, and the third skateboarding section is a blast. I think the problem is that much like Zephyr, this level just has too much content and too little space, and too much retreading of old ground. I don't dislike this submarine game, but I also wouldn't have complained if the remake had cut it altogether. Also, grabbing the gems in this room reminds me of destroying the seaweed in Aquaria Towers. I guess this is marginally better, since the time limit on the power-up gate creates a challenge since you die in the acid, but I also wouldn't need to swim around here if I could just collect gems while in the sub. I still think Zephyr, Fracture Hills, and Shady Oasis are the worst levels in the trilogy, but Lost Fleet is definitely my least favorite level in this game. Second, while the optimal path in every stage is much tighter and less dependent on within-level backtracking than Spyro 2, the game does have more of it than I remembered. In particular, Mystery Jars returned to bog down the pace of Bamboo Terrace and Charmed Ridge. I didn't like these things in Spyro 2, and I don't like them any better here. That said, two Mystery Jars in this game is strictly better than the four from Spyro 2, so I'll take what I can get. Locked Treasure Chests return from Spyro 1 and function identically here. Compared to Spyro 1 or even the Armored Chest, from Spyro 2, I find that the return trips for these are generally quicker and less intrusive thanks to the donut-shaped level design and greater abundance of shortcuts. On that note, Sheila's Alp, Sergeant Bird's Base, Bentley's Outpost, and Agent 9's Lab eschew the donut-shaped level design of the Spyro stages and fall back on the examples of Crystal Glacier or Nork Cove and being entirely linear, and I really don't understand why. Given that these stages have some within-level backtracking, going on, having a shortcut back to the beginning of the stage would have actually been really helpful, but alas. There are many other small instances of within-level backtracking sprinkled throughout Spyro 3, like this egg platform in Crystal Islands, for example. You could add a tiny platform to get back up and nothing of value would be lost. Generally speaking, however, I find these instances shorter and less pervasive than Spyro 2. Most instances pay off with meaningfully new gameplay that justifies the downtime and there's there's usually a fast way to get back on the main drag afterwards. Contrast this with Spyro 2 where the meaningless back and forth was treated as an end unto itself to pad out playtime. In my previous review, I spent a long time and probably too long complaining about the between level backtracking. Unfortunately, Spyro 3 doesn't return to the superior design of Spyro 1, where every single stage could be fully completed on the first visit. This is because, similar to the new moves from the previous game, the new playable characters must be unlocked. Similar to the talismans in the second game, you must finish every level in a hub besides the speedways to reach the next world. In fact, if you don't know the game that well, the potential backtracking is actually higher than it was 
was in the second game in terms of the sheer number of instances. Now, in a perfect world, Spiral 3 wouldn't have any between level backtracking at all, but I'm willing to tolerate it in this game for several reasons. First, much like how you could skip backtracking to Idle Springs by playing Colossus first and unlocking Swimming, most of the backtracking instances in Spiral 3 can be skipped by playing stages in a specific order. If you play Sheila's out before you play Sunny Vila, then you won't have to come back to this stage a second time for Sheila's section later. If you know that Hunter will get captured in Evening Lake a few stages in, you can play Lost Fleet first to avoid backtracking for the skateboarding section. I also don't really count the Sparks levels as between level backtracking since you're going back to the hub world all the time anyways. Because of that, there are only three instances of backtracking for 100% compared to the five in the last game. Sergeant Bird in Molten Crater, Bentley in Bamboo Terrace, and Agent 9 in Fireworks Factory. Second, the story justification for why the backtracking exists is stronger than it was in Spyro 2. Freeing the other characters and turning the tides against the sorceress feels satisfying in a way that paying money bags for the ability to jump against a wall just isn't. Third, in Spyro 2, there were no compelling reasons why the moves had to be unlockable besides padding out playtime. In Spyro 3, meanwhile, you're unlocking entirely different characters with unique sets of mechanics. Learning how to play as six characters at once would be overwhelming and confusing for new players, so making them unlockable allows the designers to pace out the new gameplay and make it more digestible. Fourth, much like Spyro 2, there are sequence-breaking glitches that allow you to enter all three of these sections early, and like the double jump and glimmer, they're all easy to learn and execute. For the Tiki Lodge, simply jump on top of this post and hover on top of the birdcage. In Bamboo Terrace, swim over this waterfall and hold up and charge, then swim through the air behind this wall. In Fireworks Factory, execute a well-timed glide to finagle yourself in between the ceiling and this antenna here. With those, you can finish all three stages in a single visit. Unfortunately, all of these glitches were removed in Spiral 3 Reignited. However, I can still tolerate coming back to these levels because 5. Spiral 3's superior level design keeps the recycled content to a minimum. Unlike Spyro 2, where revisiting a stage reset the level and force you to replay the entire stage at the very end, or in the worst instances, we kill a bunch of enemies to reactivate the power-up gates, Spyro 3 eliminates all this unnecessary repetition with its superior donut-shaped level design. Because the end-level loop shortcuts stay open on repeat visits, you can get from the start of Molten Crater to the Sergeant Bird section in about 15 seconds, and the same thing goes for the other two levels. Sixth and finally, you're revisiting a stage for substantially new content. In Spyro 2, level revisits amounted to grabbing a handful of gems and maybe playing an easy, boring minigame in the span of two minutes. In Spyro 3, revisiting a stage sees you entering a completely new section of the stage you haven't even seen before, and because you're playing as the other characters, the gameplay is substantially different as well. It's like I've been saying since my Banjo-Kazooie review. If you're going to make me revisit a stage I've already played, then at least give me something substantially new to do when I get there, and that's exactly what Spyro 3 does. This was also the only Spyro game on the PlayStation to let you warp from the Atlas, though that's a moot point now thanks to the Reignited trilogy retrofitting this feature into the first two games. In the perfect world, the side character introductory levels would loop back into the start, and these backtracking instances would have been moved to later stages. Overall, I still had more fun playing these levels than I did in either of the previous two games thanks to the fast-paced core stage design, use of side areas, and far stronger utilization of the core systems. Bosses return in Spyro 3 with more of them to fight than the previous two games combined. The main bosses in Ripto's Rage were a big improvement over the first game, and Spyro 3 uses them as a template for the new story bosses. Buzz, Spike, Scorch, and the Sorceress. The other characters provide Spyro with power-ups or other items to damage the boss. Each boss has a unique gimmick that makes them distinct, and generally speaking, the difficulty curve trends upwards while avoiding the unnecessarily beefy health bar of the GOAT boss fight in Spyro 2. I don't really have anything else to say about the bosses themselves, except they're reasonably challenging and cap off each hub world pretty well. In addition to the four main story bosses, there's also an additional eight bosses sprinkled throughout stages, making for a total of 12. While a good batch of bosses that are strictly better than the ones from Spyro 1, neither of the two bouts with the Sorceress reached the heights of the final boss with Ripto at the end of Spyro 2. Still, these battles are better than average for a collectathon game, so I'll certainly take them.
With the core gameplay largely covered, we've got to start talking about the side content, and boy oh boy is there a lot of it. In these reviews, I've sung the praises for the overall systems design in the Spyro series. The fast-paced core game loop makes the trilogy stand out from other collectathons, which are often bloated with recycled content or otherwise padded for length. However, the problem with focusing on a toolkit of simple but satisfying mechanics is that they can only stay engaging for so long before the player starts to get bored. Spyro 1 is a game that starts out really engaging and elegantly designed with a solid core and excellent level design. However, because the mechanics barely evolve as the game progresses, eventually it starts to become boring because you're doing fundamentally the same thing over and over again for four hours straight. Despite its best efforts, Spyro 2 failed to sufficiently address this issue. Besides swimming in the hover, none of the new mechanics sufficiently deepen moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, and 90% of the minigames emphasize using mechanics in the same ways you've been using them all game and therefore don't add any meaningful variety. Spyro 3 improves on both of the previous games by severely expanding the core gameplay with four new playable characters while also introducing a slew of meaningfully different gameplay, thereby eliminating the fatigue and elegance issues from the previous games once and for all. Now, many reviewers have argued that this makes Spyro 3 unfocused, with the core gameplay drowning under a tidal wave of random gameplay they didn't really sign on for. You'll recall I came to a similar conclusion on Conker's Bad Fur Day. This game could have been a great platformer, it could have been a great racer, and it could have been a great shooter, but ultimately Conker puts its fingers in so many pies that none of the individual playstyles ever reach their full potential. If you feel the same way about Spyro 3, I understand and respect that even if I personally don't agree with it. Even so, I'd argue that Spyro 3 shows considerably more restraint than Conker's Bad Fur Day or even the Jack and Sly games that succeeded it and is much better designed than all of those games to boot. Unlike all of those games, Spyro 3 never loses sight of its core gameplay. The majority of Spyro 3 is still spent playing as Spyro running, jumping, and hovering around open sandbox levels while flaming and charging enemies and collecting gems. And much like Spyro 2, a significant amount of the minigames within stages focus on the player's core mechanics, and this is all in addition to ones that are actually meaningfully different from the core gameplay. However, while most of these core-centric minigames in Spyro 2 lacked sufficient tension to generate player engagement, the ones in Spyro 3 are considerably more challenging. Compare the boring Seahorse Tower minigame game to the water tunnels in Spyro 3. Both of these use the core swimming mechanic, but the latter is more challenging since it's realistically possible to fail, meaning it actually tests your skills and is ultimately more engaging because of it. In fact, almost every core-centric minigame in Spyro 3 is a better version of a similar minigame from Spyro 2. For example, while George the Snow Leopard was pointless and didn't test the player's skills to any significant degree, Farley the Wolf is a puzzle-centric platforming section where the player must use Farley's ball to manipulate the environment and escort Farley back to Cam Clark. While the Cowlick Herding minigame in Spyro 2 was boring, repetitive, and spread the seven Cowlicks out as far as physically possible, the equivalent Sunseed minigame in Spyro 3 keeps it short and sweet with only three Sunseeds that each move through a different path, accelerating the pace and therefore the challenge along the way. Nancy the Skater forces you to split your attention and tests your timing and spatial awareness, while the equivalent Lightning Stone Thief minigame was just a bunch of pointless running around. The Thief Chases in Molten Crater and Icy Peak improve on the Spark Plug Thieves in Mystic Marsh since the use of a unique side area means you aren't being forced to revisit parts of the stage you've already played. More importantly, these chases are faster paced and therefore more exciting, not to mention more challenging. The Sleepyhead boss fight eliminates the frustrating ice physics from the Ox boss fight in Metropolis and introduces mooks to fight between sets. It's not a particularly good boss, but I'd still rather fight this guy than the Ox. The Rhinox Shooting Gallery in Bamboo Terrace requires a stronger sense of timing, as well as the ability to properly lead your 
shots, whereas the equivalent shooting gallery in Dragon Shores practically beats itself. While the seed climbing section in Zephyr forced you to waste your time hurting Calyx or backtracking from the professor to find a second seed, the progression in Jack and the Beanstalk is more puzzle heavy and faster paced. The Manta Ray shooting section is a more exciting combination of the Manta Ray rings and Aquaria towers as well as the sheep saucer dogfight in Metropolis. Generally speaking, the camera angles are far more competent and better at framing the action compared to Spyro 2, which often saddled you with the standard platforming camera when an overhead view would have been preferable. While almost all of these core-centric minigames are better than their Spyro 2 equivalents, there are a couple that are worse. For example, the Firefly Bomb minigame is a lot like the Alchemist Escort in Fracture Hills. Despite the stronger player guidance, stomping these mushrooms takes longer than charging an Earthshaper, so if the Firefly deviates from the expected path, you don't really have time to correct yourself before he slams into a mushroom and explodes. You'll also remember that I wasn't a huge fan of Colossus Hockey and Spyro 2 due to the annoying ice physics and insistence on using the standard platforming camera. Spyro 3 similarly has a weird minigame where you freeze cats and push them into your goal to score points. The ice physics and the camera angle haven't improved in the slightest, and the minigame itself is also considerably less challenging than the Colossus version. I will say that manipulating these cats feels much better to play than trying to grab the puck while repeatedly clipping through it. Ultimately, this minigame is less frustrating than the Spyro 2 version, but it's still not very good. Certain minigames follow the example of the trolley in Breeze Harbor by departing from the core gameplay altogether. One of these is the two-round hovercraft shootout. This is like the stationary cannons, except you can move around and strafe with the bumpers. This minigame is fun for what it is, though it could be a bit more challenging and make use of the lob shots to a greater degree. The boss fight against Bluto the Rhinoc uses a similar tank control scheme, only the turning is pretty harsh and you can't strafe sideways. Given that not everybody owned a DualShock, this control scheme makes sense, but I still think the Reignited Trilogy should have updated this to something more analog friendly, or at least turned down the sensitivity. Speaking of the Reignited Trilogy, by and large these core-centric minigames play just as well as they did on PlayStation, though there are some bugaboos I'd like to address. You'll recall from my last review that the overhead camera angle in the Turtle Suit minigame was reverted back to the standard platforming camera in the Reignited Trilogy. The same thing applies to Spyro 3 Reignited for minigames like the Firefly Escort, Whack-A-Mole with Bentley, and Nancy the Skater. In the case of Whack-A-Mole, I find that it doesn't really make a difference. This isn't like Crystal Popcorn, where the standard platforming camera actively clashes with the incredibly thin window to grab each crystal, which gives the AI Hunter an unfair advantage. In Whack-A-Mole, meanwhile, there are tons of moles wandering around to whack at all times, and the full analog camera control is responsive enough to frame the action properly. Nancy the Skater, meanwhile, is clearly worse than the PlayStation version of the minigame. It's hard to guard Nancy against the Rhinox when you can't see the whole playing field at once, even with the full analog camera control, leading me to lose in spots I wouldn't have with the original camera angle. Consequently, the better approach is to look around at the Rhinox alcoves, which is hard when the camera is actively fighting you the whole time. In the case of the Firefly Escort, I find that it doesn't make the minigame any worse since the problem was always predicting which mushroom to stomp and when. Additionally, the rocks no longer respawn and the hitbox for these mushrooms is a lot more generous than it used to be, so now it's a shit minigame that you can easily cheese. Regardless of all of that, there really wasn't a compelling reason to change any of these camera angles, so I've gotta wonder why Spyro 2 and Spyro 3 Reignited decided to change them to begin with. Flight sections return from the previous games and are similar to the Spyro 2 speedways. The only real change to the obstacle course gameplay is that you start off with all the possible time at the start and earn gems directly from the objects instead. These minigames were fun in previous games and they're still fun here, so I don't really have anything else left to say. Like the last game, Hunter is also hiding in each one of these speedways and finding him triggers a secret minigame. All of these minigames are basically more challenging 
challenging versions of the ones from Sparrow 2, though this time you play as Hunter himself. The only real exception is the airplane minigame, but even that's basically a more challenging version of the sheep saucer dog fight in Metropolis. Truth be told, I always considered these minigames fairly average and among the weaker minigames in Spyro 3. In both Spyro 2 and Spyro 3, they provide a brief mechanical challenge, but are generally too short to leave much of an impression. At the very least, I can say that the Spyro 3 renditions were slightly more challenging, but honestly, you could probably cut these Hunter minigames from both Spyro 2 and Spyro 3, and I wouldn't really miss them. Finally, we have the new racing sections, which basically replace the skill points from the Spyro 2 speedways. Basically, you fly through rings in a sequence while using blue boost stars to launch yourself ahead of opponents and red firework stars to temporarily immobilize your opponents long enough to fly past them. These minigames test your skills with Spyro's flight controls and require finesse to beat, while also testing you on your route knowledge of the race course vis-a-vis -vis the hidden star power-ups. Pulling off these tight turns and beating the race in first place by the seat of your pants just feels satisfying and makes for a gratifying challenge. That said, I do understand criticism that these sections are maybe a bit too challenging. And on that note, I should discuss a little known feature of the PlayStation original, automated challenge tuning. Basically, Spyro 3 tracks your performance as you play. If you play well, the game gets slightly harder, and if you struggle, the game will get slightly easier. The hard mode versions of these races can be really unforgiving, which is fine by me for the most part, but it can be frustrating to race through Mushroom Speedway seemingly perfectly, only to lose by literally half a second. Even then, I can usually beat most of these races on my second try, if not my first. Now, if you're really struggling with the race minigames, you can use optional cheat codes to lower the difficulty. Unfortunately, you can't really do this in Spyro 3 Reignited, because as far as I can tell, the automated challenge tuning was seemingly removed in favor of a single difficulty. For the most part, the remake seems to provide the hard mode versions of minigames and stages, which were never that much harder, mind you. The only real exception is the spike boss fight and the race with the Sasquatch 6, which both seem noticeably easier than I'm used to. Unfortunately, that does mean that if you are struggling with the racing sections, there's no real way around it besides getting good, which could be frustrating to the right person. Now, personally, even I think they could have toned down the races just a teensy bit, but even at their absolute worst, I'd still argue that these races represent more interesting, meaningful gameplay than any of the minigames in Spyro 2. Several commenters asked me in my Spyro 1 review why I didn't mention the flight controls being slipperier in the Reignited trilogy. As I stated in my Spyro 2 review, I didn't find that the new controls made that much of a difference for the obstacle course gameplay. The racing gameplay in Spyro 3 is a bit of a different story, and it all comes down to these blue boost star rings. In the original, the boost stars just increased your overall speed, while in the remake, it also seems to inhibit your turning in a way that's difficult to describe. Consequently, I found myself relying on the D-pad for these hairpin turns or using the left and right sticks together, both of which are noticeably tighter. Still, I found myself getting pretty frustrated with the Harbor Speedway race and my Switch run, where I kept just barely missing the rings. However, then I went back and played the section on PC and beat it in one try, so maybe the Switch analog sensitivity just sucks, or maybe I was just tilted, I don't know. Before I move on, I should note that there's an infamous glitch in the original 2000 release of Spyro 3, where if you play the time trial or race minigames but fail either of them, then shut off the console or quit the game, the eggs are soft locked and you have to start a new save file or buy a copy of the Greatest Hits version to obtain them. This glitch was fixed in the Greatest Hits and Platinum re-release of Spyro 3 as well as in Spyro 3 Reignited. As long as we're talking about flight gameplay, there's also a boss fight against two flying dragons that is, on paper, a better version of the Metropolis Sheep Saucer dogfight by virtue of being more challenging. Nevertheless, I found myself getting kind of frustrated with this boss on Switch and I can't pinpoint any version specific reasons why, so I'm gonna blame the underlying design here. While I like all of the ingredients of this fight on paper, I do think the bosses increasing in speed, hiding in alcoves, and regenerating their health is maybe a bit too much to have all at once. I mean, I can beat this fight quickly 
likely by virtue of having played it so many times before, so I would understand if newer players found this fight really frustrating. Next up, we have the skateboarding sections, with one appearing in every hub world. Now, if there's anybody that should hate skateboarding in a Spyro game, it should be me. I've never played a skateboarding game in my life, and it wasn't something I was particularly itching to play when I first played Spyro 3 in 2011, but honestly, I think these are my favorite minigames in the entire trilogy. Again, I'm sure that Tony Hawk Pro Skater or Skate have more finesse and a higher skill ceiling, but for a recurring minigame and a platformer, these skating sections are super fun, with fluid and free-flowing controls that are easy to pick up and play. The trick system is easy to learn, but difficult to master, with the skill points really encouraging you to go ham and learn the more advanced tricks. Pulling off a nasty Nork or Raging Riptail or Quintuple Rotation makes you feel like a Chad. Despite all of this, these sections still have enemies to fight, platforms to jump over, and gems to collect, meaning they don't stray too far from the core while still providing substantially different gameplay than the main stages. The difficulty curve is competent as well, with excellent skill training and guided gameplay to help the player learn the mechanics and ultimately master them. The third section combines your newfound mastery of the basic movement and tricks to race some Rhinox borders using tricks to build up a boost gauge. This introduces a unique risk-reward system surrounding which tricks to use and when and how often. This race is thrilling and provides a satisfying challenge while feeling different enough from the Speedway races to deserve being in the game. Now, I understand if people find the Sasquatch 6 race maybe a little too hard and certainly I hated them on my first playthrough. Through a combination of increased skill and increased appreciation for the design, I now find it an invigorating challenge and a perfect capstone to the best series of minigames in Spyro 3. With all of Spyro's gameplay covered, which makes up easily 80% of the game by the way, it's time to talk about the new playable characters. Sheila, Sergeant Bird, Bentley, Agent 9, and Sparks. I think the problem Insomniac ran into when trying to expand Spyro's moveset in Spyro 2 was that there wasn't much else a dragon could really do. With Spyro's mechanics already stretched to their limits in the second game, Insomniac decided to expand the core gameplay through alternate characters instead, which was probably the best approach they could have taken. Generally speaking, reviewers and commenters don't seem to really enjoy playing as these characters, and once again, that's a legitimate opinion to hold. However, being the unapologetic clickbait hipster trash that I am, I enjoy playing as all of these characters and consider them a valuable expansion of the core gameplay. That's right, I said core gameplay. Just because Spyro isn't on the screen doesn't mean it's not core gameplay. In my dated, grody old 3D Sonic reviews, I identified the essential components of Sonic when judging each of the new characters. In some cases, the characters succeeded, while in other cases they fell down pretty hard. I'd like to do the same thing for Spyro 3 in evaluating all the new characters. As I've argued in my previous reviews, the Spyro core is characterized by three sources of engagement. Platforming, combat, and exploration. These are the things that make Spyro fun to play, and so long as the mechanics of the new characters stay true to these engagement types, I have no qualms with calling them core gameplay. Let's start with Sheila, the first character you unlock and the most similar to Spyro overall. While Spyro levels tend to focus more on horizontal platforming vis-a-vis -vis gliding and hovering, Sheila's sections focus more on vertical platforming, allowing for unique level design and interesting secrets. On that note, her mechanics include hopping, air hopping, and high jumps. Sheila's sections also feature enemies to fight who she can either kick in the face or stomp from overhead. Finally, Sheila stages are full of gems to collect and secret areas to discover, meaning Sheila ticks off all three boxes for a Spyro playstyle. Out of the five characters, Sheila has the most sections in one full level and four sub areas. Out of all of these, the climb up the tower in Sunny Vila is probably my favorite, though the combat centric 2D romp through desert ruins was also pretty enjoyable. As far as the reignited trilogy goes, Sheila plays similarly to the PlayStation original. Much like Spyro, however, the analog sensitivity for movement is far more responsive and the improved animations and sound design make Sheila feel much better to play as. What's more, I noticed while pouring through footage that the collision on her kick attack seems more reliable than the original game which would often whiff through baskets and vases. Overall, as a first character, Sheila is fun to play even if she's not earth shatteringly different from Spyro. Next up we have Sergeant Bird. Much like Sheila, Sergeant Bird focuses more on vertical platforming. Basically, you hold her 
tap cross to ascend, using the left and right bumpers to strafe, and using the D-pad to turn. Admittedly, the flight could stand to be a little more free-flowing, but for what it is, it's still pretty fun. One thing I will note is that if you have the active camera feature turned on, the camera will turn whenever you strafe, so make sure to switch to the passive camera for these levels. That, and the strafe feature itself is never mentioned by NPCs or in the help menu, which is probably why a lot of people understandably don't know about it. The Reignited Trilogy fixes it so that you can comfortably strafe in active camera mode and give Sergeant Bird a more satisfying flapping animation while also making it easier to turn, making Sergeant Bird easily the best he's ever been. For some reason, however, the remake still doesn't tell you about the strafe feature in either tutorials or in the help menu, and I really don't understand why. With all that said, flying around is fun, and the emphasis on picking up and dropping objects, while simple, makes for some decent puzzle solving and mechanical variants. Sergeant Bird sports rocket launchers that auto-target enemies after a half second. You can also zoom in to snipe enemies in first-person mode, similar to Spyro Super Flame. Sergeant Bird sections are plastered with gems and offer decent secrets to discover, making them fun to explore. So while people seem to consider Sergeant Bird this weird departure from the core gameplay, he still addresses the engagement types of platforming, combat, and exploration, while feeling different enough from Spyro to add real variety. I particularly enjoy Sergeant Bird's romp through the Tiki Lodge and Molten Crater, an open-ended sandbox with side areas where the pick-up and drop mechanic is put to good use. The Cat Witch Tower has kind of an odious reputation, but it's actually one of Sergeant Bird's easiest minigames. All you really have to do is strafe out of the way with the bumpers and pop off shots as the witches fly past. Again, given that the game doesn't properly tutorialize strafing, I understand why people would struggle with this. My favorite Sergeant Bird section is in Enchanted Towers, where you get to fly around a level you already played as Sparrow and explore the towers above while dogfighting with flying lizards. It's a lot of fun and adds a new dimension to an already great level without feeling too backtracky. Next up, we have Bentley, which is easily my least favorite of the new characters to play as. While Sheila and Sergeant Bird are platforming focused characters, Bentley focuses more on combat and puzzle solving. On that note, the platforming in his sections is fairly minimal and not that interesting. Most of it amounts to a bunch of hopping up staircases and the like. I might be able to excuse that a little more if the combat was really fun, and for what it's worth, bashing the hell out of large enemies and set dressing with your club is really satisfying. The problem is that Bentley's sections don't take his powerhouse playstyle as far as they really should have. Bentley's outpost makes use of all his mechanics well and is the best section overall, with the mountain and bamboo terrace being a close second due to the emphasis on whacking boulders and large rhinox with your club. The fourth section at least has gems to collect and focuses on Bentley's combat-centric gameplay with the whack-a-mole minigame. The problem is that Bentley's third section is a shitty boxing match against the Colossus Yeti, who somehow survived being crushed. Again, I maintain that this minigame isn't nearly as bad as people say it is, since you can literally just mash the square button and cheese the boss in quick succession. But by the same token, if the best thing I can say about Yeti boxing is that you can brute force your way through it, that's not the sign of a well-designed fun minigame. For what it's worth, the controls in the reignited version of this game seem faster paced and more free-flowing than the original. Rather than wasting the player's time with something nobody wanted to play, I think Insomniac would have been better off including a boss fight against one of these evil snowman guys. Maybe they could have emphasized this deflection mechanic that is introduced in Bentley's outpost and never used again? I don't know, anything was more fitting than this. Despite his flaws, I can't say I really hated playing Bentley's sections either. Two out of the four sections are well designed and use his mechanics well, and the fourth one is fine enough. Not to mention that we've still got tons of gems to find and nooks and crannies to explore. Bentley has combat and exploration and passes muster for platforming, but I really would have liked more platforming and a boss fight of some kind. Much like Sheila, Bentley plays almost identically to his PlayStation counterpart in the Reignited trilogy, though his animations and movement feel slightly better. The camera angle was also shifted to an over-the-shoulder viewpoint, and given how bulky this character is, that was probably the right call. Finally, we have Agent 9, who's my favorite of the four new characters. Agent 9 controls identically to Mega Man Volnet in the first Mega Man Legends game. The D-pad and the analog stick function like a tank, while the left and right bumpers allow you to strafe, similar to Sergeant Bird and the hovercraft. 
combat. Like Bentley, Agent 9 is a combat-focused character, only his sections emphasize aiming and shooting at enemies rather than beating them with the club. Shooting enemies is satisfying, and like Spyro and Sergeant Bird, you can zoom in and shoot enemies in first-person mode if you want. Agent 9 can also pick up grenades and hurl them at armored enemies to damage them. Like all the previous characters, gems and chests are scattered across Agent 9 stages, making for rewarding exploration. Many reviewers and commenters have criticized Agent 9 on PlayStation for his unorthodox control scheme, and I can certainly understand why. Dual analog has been the standard in console shooters in the intervening two decades, and for good reason. Thankfully, the Reignited trilogy updates Agent 9's controls to include dual analog and shooting with the right trigger. You can still play with the D-pad and the bumpers if you want, but I imagine new players will have an easier time playing with the analog sticks. The aiming and shooting is functional and works well, though I can't help but find that it makes these sections easier than they used to be. My only real complaint with the new controls is that if you're used to uninverted aiming controls like I am, but prefer inversion for the normal camera, you have to go in and change the inversion for the camera before and after every Agent 9 section. While that's mildly annoying, it's a momentary inconvenience at worst. What's also worth noting is that if you're playing Spyro 3 Reignited on PC, the game supports mouse and keyboard for faster and more accurate aiming. Even if you prefer a normal controller for Spyro, the game allows you to switch to mouse and keyboard on the fly, making Agent 9 overall best on PC. As for Agent 9's levels, I love them all, though I could do without the backtracking in Agent 9's lab. Shooting enemies and dodging projectiles is hectic and fun, and all of Agent 9's sections are just challenging enough to introduce tension and thus engagement. The first person shooter section in Fireworks Factory is one of my favorite sections in the entire trilogy. Shooting up ninjas and destroying enemy generators is just loads of pulse pounding fun and the challenge is just high enough to keep you on your toes. Another one of my favorites is the rail shooter section, which is a more challenging version of the rail shooter section in Canyon Speedway in the last game. These dinosaurs are out for blood, so you've gotta be really quick on the draw, making for a tense and challenging romp that rewards you with hidden gems afterwards. Mastering the controls and triumphing over all the enemies in Agent 9 sections is just satisfying and something I look forward to revisiting every time I replay Spyro 3. While I do maintain that Agent 9 could have used more platforming in his levels, the combat and exploration is there and I still find his sections a unique expansion of the Spyro core while offering meaningfully different gameplay. In addition to the four critters, Sparks is also playable in this game as well. These stages are arcadey, top-down shooter sections focusing on combat, puzzles, and exploration. The enemies put up a strong fight and the power-ups are satisfying to use. Levels themselves force you to think about how to progress and are filled with gems to collect and secrets to find, and each one ends with a face-off against a decently challenging boss. Unlike all the other characters, Sparks can't jump at all, meaning that this is officially not core gameplay. Still, two out of three threads ain't bad, and the levels themselves are fun in their own right and diversify the gameplay. While the Reignited trilogy updated Agent 9's controls to use dual analog, for some reason Sparks' control scheme carries over verbatim to the remake. That's fine by me, seeing as the existing control scheme is well tutorialized and easy to pick up and play, but I feel like the option for a twin stick control scheme would have been worthwhile. What's nice about the PC version is that we get full mouse and keyboard support, allowing you to aim with the mouse and strafe with WASD, making these sections that much better. I should also mention that the PC version supports using the mouse and flying sections as well as in first person aiming. What's also nice is that playing these stages unlocks new perks for sparks, including farther gem grabs and extra hit point and the ability to break baskets and vases. In the original, this is where you officially unlock the sparks treasure finder. For some reason, you just start off with this game breaking ability in Spyro 2, even though nothing in the game tells you that you have it. I have seen some Spyro 2 fans complain that you don't start with the treasure finder in Spyro 3, but if you're really desperate, you can input a cheat code to unlock it early, much like the all abilities cheat code in Spyro 2. The cheat varies between the original and greatest hits versions, so make sure you enter the correct one. The last Sparks level also unlocks the Atlas Warp for more convenient fast travel. Spyro 3 Reignited follows the examples of Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 Reignited in just starting you off with both of these abilities, so again, if you really need the treasure finder at the start of the game, you can just play the remake.
In terms of the full completion experience, Spyro 3 is absolutely chock full of content, and while not all of it is great, 100%ing this game is still straightforward to keep track of. Like those games, achieving full completion unlocks a secret final level, Super Bonus Round, which is my second favorite final stage in the trilogy behind Nasty's Loot. Much like that level, you spend a lot of it chasing around thieves to collect treasure, along with a combo power-up to shoot down sheep saucers, and a secret dogfight to the death against the sorceress. All of that sounds pretty good, so why isn't this my favorite of the final levels? Well, personally, I find it disappointing that Sheila, Sergeant Bird, Bentley, and Agent 9 don't see a final section of gameplay to send off their playstyles. Instead, we get another round of that meh submarine minigame. Again, I don't hate playing this, but I would have preferred to see the hovercraft or the water tunnels come back instead. Finally, as much as I love the skateboard gameplay, I would I will admit that I raged just as hard at the Sasquatch 6 as everybody else when I first played Super Bonus Round. At this point, I'm good enough at the skateboarding to appreciate the challenge, but I get why people find this frustrating. Ultimately, I think I just prefer the simplicity and better overall execution of Nasty's loot, but this is still a much better final level than whatever Dragon Shores was supposed to be. Skill points return from Spyro 2, but unfortunately, you still have to wait until after you've defeated the final boss to be able to view them. Thankfully, however, the skill point list will tell you which stages have skill points before you've unlocked them. However, the actual task you need to complete is still blanked out in the meanwhile. While that's pretty annoying, at least I know where I'm supposed to be looking this time around. Like the other games, Spiral 3 Reignited lists all the skill points and where to find them from the get-go, completely eliminating the need to look them up on the internet. As for the skill points themselves, I guess they're marginally easier than they were in Spyro 2. Personally, I think the racing sections are a suitable replacement for the time trials and the obstacle courses, but I'm not sure why the challenge runs for the bosses were removed. Given that none of them are as long or repetitive as Gulp, I think it would have made for a fun challenge for Scorcher Spike. Instead, we do stuff like breaking signs, killing a swimming chicken, burning trees, or shooting all the windows in this tower, etc. Even the first two course records challenges are easy to rack up if you can pull off a raging Ripto or two. The course record for the Lost Fleet track is actually pretty hard and basically requires you to finish the course without falling off the cliff. Granted, many of the skill points in Spyro 2 weren't difficult or big-brained, but yeah. Once again, collecting skill points in the original unlocks pages of an epilogue that shows you what happened to all the characters after this game. Spyro 3 confirms that not only is Ripto still kicking after the Spyro 2 epilogue, but Nasty Nork similarly survived disappearing in a puff of smoke like this is Sonic Lost World or something. Fun fact, the plot of Enter the Dragonfly was actually going to be based on this epilogue, but Nasty was ultimately cut from the game and reintroduced in Hero's Tale instead. My favorite part of the epilogue is actually the final page. It gives you the sense that Insomniac had the time of their lives designing these games, and it's almost enough to make me shed a tear. Almost. Once again, the reignite United Trilogy replaces the epilogue with the concept art gallery, which is... Fine. Again, I just don't understand why something charming like the epilogue was cut from the remake while something like boxing wasn't. So, at this point I've thoroughly covered the original game, so what else is there to say about the reignited version? Well, remember how the Xbox One X and PS4 Pro versions took about 20 to 30 seconds to load a stage depending on the level? Despite the Switch using internal flash memory as opposed to the super slow HDDs on the other systems, shockingly the load times are actually 5 to 8 seconds longer depending on the stage. And on that note, we might as well compare load times of all four versions at once just for the lols. Oh my, oh my, uh, can you help us? Hordes of ferocious Rhinox have overrun our town and kidnapped the mayor. Mm. <laughs> 
You'll recall that the Xbox and PlayStation versions took about 11 seconds to reignite the level whenever Spyro dies, but the Switch version actually increases that by an additional 5 seconds. I was tolerating these load screens in the other two versions, but I'm 3 games in now and I'm absolutely sick of these. Seriously, why does dying necessitate a 16 second loading time when it doesn't in any other game I've ever played? Again, all of these load times are severely reduced on PC, especially the reigniting load screens, and because there's no intro-outro scenes in the level, Spyro 3 Reignited can load stages marginally faster than Spyro 2 Reignited. One thing I neglected to mention in the previous two reviews is that the map feature from Spyro 2 has been retrofitted into Spyro 1 and Spyro 3 Reignited. It's a nice bit of added convenience, though personally, I find that Spyro levels are small enough and straightforward enough that a map really isn't necessary, but I'm sure that a new player will get some use out of it. Another change that's exclusive to Spyro 3 Reignited is this new Mega Whirlwind that appears after you defeat the Sorceress, which takes you to a distant platform with extra lives. Originally, this is going to be where you found Super Bonus Round, but Insomniac cut it while one of the lead artists was out on vacation. In any event, it's a small but appreciated addition to an already great remake. Speaking of changes exclusive to this version, the original ending cutscene kind of sucks. Personally, I don't really care that much because I fully complete collectathon games since I just think that's how they're meant to be played. Still, this cutscene almost feels like a joke at the player's expense. Year of the Dragons, uh, what the completion was very disappointing. <laughs> what? Uh, uh, Year of the Dragons, uh, completion. This will be the finale the part, by the way, very, guys. Uh, was very, uh, this will be the for disappointment. Yeah, like where the little baby dragon just burps. I'm like, I, I spent most of my life playing this game and finally beating it for this. Oh well. The reignited version of this cutscene, meanwhile, is super cute and shows the dragon elders from the remake of the first game bonding with the baby dragons. Strangely, while orb animations were made to be unskippable in Spyro 2 Reignited, the dragon egg animations remain skippable in Spyro 3 Reignited. Though, chest opening animations are still unskippable, just like they were in Spyro 1 Reignited. On that note, while baby dragon hatching animations had more unique animations in the original, the remake cuts out a lot of the more memorable ones. The eggs themselves were also redesigned slightly to better resemble their Spyro 1 counterparts. As we all know, Activision rushed the reignited trilogy out the door, and when you're on a strict production schedule, you've gotta cut non-essential features. Consequently, I don't blame the developers for cutting animations that 90% of the audience was just gonna skip anyway. Speaking of this remake being rushed, we've got to talk about glitches. Ever since the Reignited trilogy came out, Spyro 3 Reignited quickly developed a reputation as the glitchiest of the three games. On that note, I will say besides the PC exclusive bug in Alpine Ridge and the animations breaking at unlocked frame rates, Spyro 1 and Spyro 2 Reignited seemed basically spotless as far as glitches go. The worst I found was this collision glitch in Colossus while grabbing handheld footage on Switch. Unfortunately, despite Activision hiring on Sanzaru Games to pick up the slack on the third game and even delaying the trilogy for quality assurance reasons, Spyro 3 Reignited nevertheless suffered by virtue of being the last game worked on, which is a shame. While it is true that Spyro 3 Reignited has more glitches per capita than the other two games in the package, I can't help but find the issue somewhat exaggerated. I'm sure that a great deal of it got patched out after the initial release, but Spyro 3 Reignited was the only game I played at launch on PS4 Pro and I don't recall running into any major problems. A lot of this glitch discourse seems motivated by people hating Sanzaru games, who many of you will know for Sly 4, Flanderization in Time, as well as the 3DS Sonic Boom games. While it's true that this third game could have used a little more time in QA, Spyro 3 Reignited is a complete, finished product that was clearly tested. Also, let's not forget that the original Spyro 3 was also rushed and had its own share of glitches and cut content, as my comparison of the Black Label and Greatest Hits versions reveals. So let's go over all the glitches that I happen to find. I'll preface this discussion by saying that I only have my own personal experience to go off of here. I'm sure that many of you ran into a glitch that I didn't, and I believe you. But I'm also not going to replay this game 50 times to find every possible 
glitch because at some point I've gotta move on to other games. With that said, let's go to the list. Sheila and Bentley don't seem to have any animations for going through portals. These pillars in this room and Cloud Spires have some funky collision geometry. Spyro is oddly stationary during the Bluto boss. In my PC run, Sergeant Bird suddenly dropped like a rock in the Tiki Lodge, though I was unable to recreate this glitch later and it didn't happen in my Switch run. The gem dropped from this Rhinoc clipped through the floor in my Switch run and it took me a really long time to figure out what happened. This glitch didn't occur in my PC run and I was unable to reproduce it on command. This mystery jar in Bamboo Terrace didn't shatter like it was supposed to on PC. Similarly, the stained glass window also failed to shatter properly. Also, I discovered that if you shoot out a panda at the exact time you kill the last Rhinoc in the shooting gallery minigame, the screen will fade to black, not fade back in, and still give you the dragon egg. Unfortunately, I wasn't recording footage at the time of the glitch, so you'll have to take my word for it. After defeating Spike, Spyro slides backwards into the Whirligig seat. This also happened on my Switch run. Moneybags' his feet phase through the floor and frozen altars in both my PC and Switch runs. Also, when the final NPC in this stage goes through the exit portal, the sound effect of his footsteps loops indefinitely on PC. This didn't happen on my Switch run, and since I can trigger it consistently on PC, it seems to be a version exclusive bug. Also, I accidentally managed to line up this frozen cat in such a way to clip this hockey Rhinoc up to the rim of the arena. The collision geometry in Lost Fleet Skate Park is clunky in this area, though still very playable. Still, I ran into what seems to be an invisible wall in this area on both my PC and Switch runs. If you manage to flame these ninja Ninja Rhinox at the precise moment they jump up towards the ceiling, it's possible for the gem drop to get stuck in the ceiling, which happened on my Switch run. However, this didn't happen in my PC run, and I couldn't manage to reproduce it later. This breakable wall and desert ruins didn't disappear after I broke it until I walked through it. This glitch didn't occur in the Switch version, and I was unable to replicate it on PC. The decal map on this giant door disappears and reappears when you get close enough to it. In Haunted Tomb, this dog here stopped in front of the exit portal, and this happens every time I replay the level on PC. Finally, in my PC run of Super Bonus Round, this thief managed to get himself stuck under a sheep saucer, which is reproducible but tricky to pull off. Also, I heard a thief laughing next to the sorceress's chamber after I'd killed all the thieves. And that's it. Most of these things are cosmetic and don't really affect gameplay to any significant degree, and given that many of them are difficult to replicate, I don't really think they're that big of a deal. In fact, I think the Speedway egg glitch in the original release of Spyro 3 is worse than anything in this remake. However, the gem glitches are really annoying when they do happen since they force you to reload the stage and the collision geometry in Lost Fleet Skate Park does feel legitimate clunky and makes the minigame worse compared to the PlayStation version. While I do agree that this game deserved more time and polish and that these cosmetic glitches can be distracting, I don't think any of them are nearly bad enough to ruin this remake. So, remake or rebreak? How well does Spyro 3 Reignited recreate and improve upon Year of the Dragon? Well, first of all, I want to say that the original Spyro 3 is a fantastic game and the perfect high note to end a great trilogy of games. The story is by far the best of the three games, with a decent cast of interesting characters, a unique world, a compelling central conflict, a strong emotional core in Bianca's character arc, and contemptible antagonists in The Sorceress and Moneybags. The plot also effectively motivates gameplay as a means of getting even with the sorceress, a compelling villain the player loves to hate, while providing excellent macro goal feedback. The graphics flex the spiral art style to its breaking point with the best models and texture work of the three games, making for the overall prettiest game of the three. The soundtrack is an improvement over the already great offering in Ripto's Rage, with the overall strongest compositions, most diverse soundscape, and most memorable melodies, while still preserving Copeland's trademark fantasy atmosphere and ambiance. Spyro himself is the best he's ever been, with the core 
game loop and mechanics being just as intoxicating as ever, paired with overall trickier platforming than Spyro 2, as well as more consistent and engaging secrets to discover compared to even Spyro 1. Enemies better reflect their more challenging counterparts in Spyro 1, while the bosses are the best and most numerous in the trilogy. The level design perfects a winning formula of a tight, fast-paced main pathway that loops back into the start of the level with tons of convenient shortcuts, as well as side areas to bring out the best of each minigame without overcomplicating and bloating the expected path. On top of that, the Spyro-focused minigames are generally better than the previous games, with many of them being straight-up better versions of minigames from Spyro 2. Generally speaking, minigames are more consistently challenging and therefore rewarding, especially the speedway races. Skateboarding is also a highlight of the game, with effective skill training, a competent escalation of challenge, and a simple but engaging trick system. Unlike the previous two games, which both stretched out the core game loop so thin that it eventually became boring, Spyro 3 expands significantly on the core with new characters while still giving Spyro the significant majority of the content. Sheila and Sergeant Bird effectively capitalize on the core Spyro appeal of platforming, combat, and exploration. While Bentley and Agent 9 could have used more platforming in their sections, they absolutely nail combat and exploration despite Bentley wasting one of his sections on a crappy boxing minigame. Finally, while Sparks has no platforming at all, his levels are really fun in their own right and pay off with some engaging boss battles. Also, I'm just gonna say it, the sections where you play as these other characters are better than any of the minigames in Spyro 2, and I genuinely believe that Spyro 3 would be worse off without them. With the exception of the boxing minigame and maybe the Firefly Escort, but even that has some really fun exploration in it. Between the Spyro-centric minigames, fun and satisfying characters that expand the core while offering meaningfully different gameplay, expanded speedway sections, and a surprisingly enjoyable recurring skateboarding minigame, Spyro 3 is by far the most varied, challenging, and consistently engaging game in the original trilogy. And Spyro 3 achieves all of this without throwing away Spyro's game feel from the previous games. Fast-paced, collect-a-thon action that's straightforward and simple to fully complete. You know something? Spyro 3 is easily the longest game in the original trilogy, but for me, it really doesn't feel like it. There was no point during any of my three playthroughs of this game where the core Spyro gameplay ever got boring. Probably because all the new gameplay distracted me from it long enough for me to actually miss it. Contrast this with Spyro 1, where I found myself wanting to take breaks every hour or so after Magic Crafters, or Spyro 2, where by the time I had slogged through 11 stages in Autumn Plains, I just wanted the game to end. For all these reasons and more, Spyro Year of the Dragon is by far my favorite Spyro game ever made, and my vote for the best game on the original PlayStation. Put simply, Spyro Year of the Dragon is one of my favorite games of all time, right up there with Donkey Kong Country 2 and Paper Mario 64. That said, Spyro 3 is not a perfect game, and I I tried to cover every down point that I could think of. As great as the plot is, there are a handful of annoying plot holes and contrivances. While I enjoy a vast majority of the minigames, there are a couple that are weaker than their Spyro 2 equivalents, a few that are perhaps a hair too challenging for newer players, a few that are just kind of okay, and a couple that are flat out bad. While I'm willing to tolerate the three level revisits after unlocking certain characters, in an ideal world the game wouldn't have any revisits at all. Similarly, there are more instances of within-level backtracking than I remembered, and the game would probably be better off if some of them were cut. While I love the alternate characters, Bentley and Agent 9 really could have used more platforming, and I would have loved one more section for each character in Super Bonus Round. Oh, and there are some annoying glitches in the original release, but that can easily be resolved by playing the green label NTSC version. Most of the stuff is pretty minor in the grand scheme of things, especially compared to everything Spyro 3 does well. While I can absolutely understand why someone would prefer the more focused Spyro 1, and while Spyro 2 is unique for its sequence breaks and New Game Plus, personally, I prefer Spyro 3 to both of these games because it simply has the most engaging and consistent high points. In any event, I still maintain that it's a resounding improvement over Spyro 2. Spyro 3 accomplishes everything that game set out to do better and more consistently. Of course, you're welcome to dislike this game or prefer other games, but I'm just saying. So, with all that said, I'd like to rate the reignited version of Spyro 3 a remake. I reserve this score for remakes 
that improve the visuals, fix issues with the original, and maybe add new content. Still, a remake might have some issues left untouched or other neglected opportunities to improve. Spyro 3 Reignited inherits all of the improvements from the previous two games, including the better controls, superior movement feedback, and full analog camera control. While I personally never minded having to unlock the treasure finder or the atlas warp in the original, I've come to appreciate the convenience of just having them in the remake. Spiral 3 Reignited features the most detailed, stylized, and overall impressive visuals of the three games in the trilogy. Additionally, the soundtrack features Stefan Vonkov's strongest work for the trilogy overall, with some excellent new instrument choices that make the best soundtrack in the trilogy sound that much better. While Spiral 1 and Spiral 2 recycled the original scripts and failed to make any improvements, Spiral 3 Reignited adds a few new lines of dialogue to give the alternate characters a little more agency. It also revises the sorceress's characterization slightly to round out her motivation and make it more understandable. When it comes to gameplay, Spiral 3 Reignited is the only game of the three to feature any improvements. While Spiral 1 Reignited failed to improve the bosses, and Spiral 2 Reignited failed to improve the mediocre minigames and terrible backtracking while removing all the original sequence breaks as well as the all abilities cheat code, Spiral 3 Reignited actually addresses people's complaints with Agent 9 by updating his controls to use dual analog aiming. Additionally, if you're playing on PC, you can play with mouse and keyboard as both Agent 9 and Sparks to make their sections that much better. So if I have so many positives with Spyro 3 Reignited, then why not rate this game a replace? Like I said in my Spyro 1 review, I reserve this score for only the best of the best, the remakes I can recommend over their original versions without question. While Spyro 3 Reignited does a lot of things right and is ultimately my preferred version of one of my favorite games of all time, it's not beyond reproach and it's clear that this game suffered somewhat from the trilogy's strict production schedule. For example, like in Spyro 2 Reignited, many games with alternate camera angles have reverted to the standard platforming camera. While most of them play fine regardless, Nancy the Skater is clearly worse to play here. Moreover, while I maintain that the game's reputation regarding glitches is exaggerated, especially after the patches, it's also clear that the game could have used more QA and post-game support. While most of the glitches I stumbled across were cosmetic or otherwise benign, there were a handful of gem or collision related glitches that were mildly annoying and adversely affected the gameplay. Even then, I couldn't get many of these glitches to trigger consistently, still I would have gladly waited longer for that extra bit of polish. Despite these missteps, this is still a great way to play one of my favorite games of all time and between the superior visuals, stronger soundtrack, and gameplay improvements, I'm willing to tolerate a handful of glitches and some missed opportunities. As I've always said, I'm willing to take the bad with the good to enjoy a game that's worth enjoying, and Spyro 3 Reignited is a game worth enjoying. This has been a two hour long review of Spyro 3, and I hope you enjoyed it despite my opinions being wrong. However, we're not quite done with the Reignited trilogy just yet. Join me next time for an editorial where I talk about some things I've been meaning to discuss. If you liked today's review, make sure to give it a like and consider subscribing for more. You can also find me on the Unversed cast, where I meet up with Hadox, Ryrule, and King K to talk about video games and read bad fanfiction. You can find video versions of the podcast on YouTube and an audio version on SoundCloud and iTunes. I also have a Let's Play channel, EPG Plays, where I do informative playthroughs of games I like and some I don't. It's also the new home of Zebro's Play, sillier playthroughs I do with my brother. Be sure to go check those out. Out. Until next time, I'm Exo Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review.